Ladies and gentlemen, Chris right. West. So, on to the presentation. Um, post roll commission, we have to say lots of things about what we're not doing. Um, yeah, effectively, we're not giving advice today. Really take this as really information. It's really about education, um, etc. So, what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about sort of three, three big things. We're going to say, okay, let's give a big picture overview about what's informing how we're thinking about investing and, and investing in and building portfolios for you. Yeah, a little bit about how those, you know, it's probably felt pretty turbulent. Um, you know, every every time in the news there's something and another bank's you know, no longer operating under its own steam. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago when yeah, Russia and Ukraine, Russia hadn't invaded Ukraine, that's not that long, that long ago. It wasn't that long ago when cash rates were 0 0.1. Uh, it feels like lots has happened in in, in markets in, in you know, the last 12 or 18 months and just reflecting back on how portfolios have been going. Um, and then and then really to sort of give you some insights about you know, the Securitas approach to, to investing and how the combination of what we're seeing in the world, both in the short and long term, uh, combined with the philosophy and what and what the team believe are the priorities for you, uh, and and what that means in terms of how they're looking at portfolios going forward. All right. Now, how many times was inflation mentioned on the news two years ago? Probably sick of it, right? Um, but but I think it is important just to. You know, draw out a couple of key points on inflation today because ultimately for the, all of us in this room, the thing that impacts how much you can spend, because ultimately most of us are going to be saving for retirement for different points in the saving cycle, but we're all saving for retirement. And, and the thing that impacts how much you can spend is how much the things cost, right? So it is really important. And in many ways, we perhaps say it's probably you know, um, a good thing people have been reminded that inflation is real because for many of us, we haven't really seen genuine inflation um, uh, impact, impact you know, people's real cost of living. So it's something that we need to be really mindful of when looking at portfolios. Um, you know, just looking at some of these unintended consequences of these rate, rate rises, we talk about you know, what might be breaking and, and looking around the corner at what might break next. And so how do we avoid accidentally um, having exposures to things that might might cause unnecessary issues for portfolios. Looking at you know, recession, what that could mean, um, and they're sort of they're sort of all sort of what we'd say short term things. No, no, I don't mean one month or something. I mean over the next couple of years. And, and then we're looking at out a bit further. What does next? What does the next 10, 20 years look like? And what are the things going to impact the investment world uh, over the horizon? Okay, went one too far. Right, and timely. Had to, had to update the presentation after yesterday because uh, people weren't really thinking the cash rate was going to go again. Um, but uh, the, the quote that came out from Governor Lowe yesterday really says everything. Right, basically said most of the first five minutes of what I was going to talk about today. Um, don't worry too much about the blue line. Basically, they're both saying that goods inflation, as in the price of stuff uh, and services inflations, have both been going on. Right. But, but really, this bolded bit is the issue, right? Because so when you have goods inflation, who, who remembers the um, the, con the container ships in the Chinese ports coming out of COVID, right? And people go, oh, we might have some inflation. This, this might come back. We've got some bottlenecks. You know, everyone's got this demand ramp up after COVID. Um, reopening happened. You know, big demand, um, you yeah, had supply issues that obviously got exacerbated by, by um, conflict in Ukraine. That sort of started the cost of things going up. Right? But for those who've been around long enough to know that inflation is almost a psychology, psychology game. All right? The, the cost of things going up matters to a certain point. And we, this sort of thing we've been, we've been looking at is if, if, if the cost of things are going up, that can be temporary. The real issue you can get, or the real risk we get worried about that we want to make sure we're protecting against in your portfolio is, is saying, okay, if we get to a point where the labor market's pretty hot, man, the unemployment in the threes is a pretty pretty good economy, really. I think we, we should reflect on that. That's a pretty good, pretty good thing. I know the RBA and that get a lot of criticism. I go, hey, you, you've managed out of the 
pandemic, you've you've managed to come out of a zero interest rate world and you've got unemployment in the threes, inflation's a little bit high, you haven't had a collapse in the housing market, but it's cooled. Uh, I'm going to be a bit controversial and say, I think they're doing okay. Uh, they could have, could have ended up a lot worse and history has shown a lot worse outcomes out of these sort of scenarios. Um, but if, 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 we're, if we sort of yeah, look at that, um, the, the, now that we've got that, the psychological element of the flat inflation, that's the thing that we're really worried about, which is, okay, now that I think the prices are going to go up, I'm going to put my prices up. And if I put my prices up, then the person I supply things to puts my prices up. Even if I'm a worker and I say, well, I need a, I need a higher wage. And you get what's called the, we prefer to call it a price wage spiral, not a wage price spiral, but this is the end that Katie used to talk about this 30 odd years ago. Um, but you, you can get this situation where expectations, particularly in the short term around inflation are entrenched. And so people keep on expecting it. And then that's why you're getting these, you know, the demand pressures plus those expectations we're getting both in Australia and, and globally, in that short term, this is in the US, and that's stuck, right? You're getting that services inflation, as in things, not stuff, the things that are not stuff. At me, the cost of those is getting higher, and that inflation of those costs is getting sticky, right? And that's what Governor Lowe was worried about. Now, ultimately, the reason for the rate rise yesterday is stickiness of inflation as in if it gets stuck there and keeps on compounding out that really impacts the cost of living so when we're looking at portfolios we just want to be conscious of this as a risk going forward and whether this does continue you know there's lots of things in the world that you can make underwrite an argument to say that it's all going to go back to normal it's all going to be okay because in the long term that's actually what markets are saying the central banks have kind of got it under control um, we're going to have a return to a sort of more normal level. You don't particularly need to worry about all the different countries on this chart. There's only one where we spend most of our money, although I'm sure most people in the next few months wouldn't want a holiday to France. Um, but, but, but over here, um, before... This is very technical for a Wednesday. Before Russia invaded um, Ukraine, what, what's called break-even inflation? Anyone heard that term before? Yeah, didn't think so. Uh, but, but basically, it's what markets expect inflation to be over a 10-year view, right? So the, the RBA tries to target inflation between 2 and 3% to get price stability. So prices go up a little bit, but, but not a lot. Before Russia invaded Ukraine in December 2021, break-even inflation in, in Australian markets was 2.3. We fast forward today... If I if we go to you know um, sort of March hey, the the March twenty uh, sorry the March twenty twenty three print um, was two point three again All right and so what that saying is yep yeah, this looks short term but over the long term markets are expecting it to to come under control and our point which we're going to talk about a little bit later about the positioning for portfolios is that's really good if that works out like that. But we just want to make sure we've got a little bit of protection in case it doesn't, all right? Because markets think it's going to be okay, but sometimes markets get things wrong, and that if if that is wrong, that really impacts your ability to to spend your time and savings. So we want to make sure we're just adding a little bit of protection, just in case it gets stuck for a bit longer. But why? You know, why markets think everything's okay? Uh, wait, on the inflation side. Is because effectively, as we all know, interest rates by central banks have been rising. But the interesting thing is how coordinated they've been. It's pretty rare for all economies around the world, so many economies around the world, to be going from a low base and then they all go up together. Right? So it's basically all coming along and all of the handbrakes have gone on at once. Um, Again, don't worry too much detail about all the schools. Um, the point is, they're all down the bottom and they're all shot up at the end. And this has obviously started to have impacts. Now, people have probably been watching the banks over the last few days. You know, First Republic, most recently, 
Credit Suisse, the first, what's called another technical term today, globally systemically important financial institution to have problems, um, Silicon Valley Bank and, and some other US regional banks. I've obviously heard about that, but that, you know, that's just now. Does anyone remember last year that all the concerns about the UK pensions? Can. Um, effectively, when you put this big handbrake on, interest rates go from zero to something a bit closer to normal. Uh, it has caused issues, right? Things are starting to crack. Little bits can crack, a little bit there cracks, but ultimately it's the same sort of issue. A combination of the change in interest rates being so sharp and some imperfect risk management, I'll diplomatically say, um, that could have been better in each case, but a different different way. And ultimately that just adds to that little that little set of issues, right? And so what, what we're really looking for next is, um, you know, the GFC and other really bad scenarios, ultimately there were a few little cracks that in hindsight seemed really obvious and then altered and re resulted in a really big crack, right? And so what we want to make sure is we're looking around the corner and we're talking with the again, Securitas advice team and saying, emptying our investment community meeting and saying, okay, let's, let's just look around the corner and make sure we understand where the next crack might be. Because right? there's not very much you can do about after a crack's happened, right? Because mm -hmm. already priced in markets. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that we're sort of looking out for, which can be a risk and an opportunity, is, is in the real estate market. Now, this chart's a little bit out of date. But when you buy property, right? Generally, most people understand property. It's actually the, actually the world's oldest asset class um, up after gold, right? Uh, well, no, not property. And, and, and the, you, can, you can own property in two ways. So you can own it in the public markets, what we call listed property. So it's bought and sold via a REIT, like you know, a vicinity centres, you've probably seen vicinity shopping centres around, uh, or a Dexas, you know, there's buildings around, office buildings, etc. You can buy them on the market and they're there and they're priced every day between between willing buyers and sellers and you there's a price that, that those can transact at. Um, the other way they're held is more like your house. Right? It's held in an unlisted market. Right? A lot of property is held in listed markets globally and a lot is held in unlisted markets because it's a very big asset class. Um, typically, so, so portfolio like the security asset portfolios generally and you know, that they're going to be because we, we've got people looking to have pensions and things like that. You want to have lots of liquidity so you generally have the bulk price frequently public markets exposures or listed property. Um, but often sort of an industry fund style approach might have unlisted property it's often often what happens and diff there's nothing right or wrong about them they're both the same assets ultimately uh, it's just different structure uh, and 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 old, over time they end up delivering pretty similar returns but what you've had in the last few years is a bit of a liquidity what we'd call a liquidity mismatch so demand for certain assets um that, that outstrips the supply and you've ended up in a situation here this is comparing the returns the orange one of the um the listed market the listed rate or real estate investment trust is listed market property and this dark blue line the unlisted so what that's saying is over five years the holding the listed market got you basically a zero return for the full tree but if you held an unlisted you got 15 percent per annum return and that's pretty funny because often they're exactly the same asset All right and so we go is is, is that a crack if the liquidity that had been provided to buy all these unlisted assets turns the other way. And that's actually what you're starting to see. You might see in the news something called Blackstone um, and closing fund redemptions. These are the sort of little things where you go, that could be a risk. And so we're just trying to make sure if we have unintended exposures in client portfolios, get them out of the way of the cracks. All right? There's no need to hold things that are you know, potentially at risk if we get more cracks that we them. The good, the good news is we don't think there's any GFC around the corner. We're just doing our jobs for you. <laughs> um, the, the other one is this recession, right? So uh, uh, one of the things we look for is if you get, you know, this can be quite tricky um, to predict. Um, 
it's very hard to predict the start and end and the magnitudes and all those things, but it does have implications, particularly if we're looking at the portfolios for people that um, material amounts might be drawn down in the next few years. Right? So a significant amount of portfolio, portfolio might be drawn down. You go, oh, if you get back in economic conditions, you might get what's called sequency risk. Right? So you might get a bad outcome just when you don't want it. So we're just, again, trying to look around the corner and trying to manage risk for clients and make sure that portfolios are appropriately resilient when you get elevated risks of these things, these type of things happening. Um, what this chart over here is saying, there's probably a better than 50, 50% chance that the US goes into a recession by next year. Right? So we just want to go, okay, if that's a pretty big risk, we'll make sure the portfolios are resilient against that. But the good news is all this is when we were, I was talking to you two years ago, you had to take risk to get any return. Right? Does everyone remember getting 0.25 on a term deposit? Yeah, what was it like long ago? The good thing you know, that people sort of miss often is depending on your outlook for inflation, assuming it's not too high, you can now get 4% in the back in um, Aussie banks, safe. US regional banks, not so safe. Uh, but in, in, you, know, you can get a 4% return in the bank and you don't have to take lots of risk in portfolios. You can take some risk that's appropriate for your needs, but you're starting at a pretty good rate of return. Uh, this, people sort of look at all this bouncing around, all the volatility. Of, for us, this is fantastic. Two years ago, we were pulling our hair out. It's not the only reason I don't have as much hair anymore. That's mainly my three kids. Um, but we were pulling our hair out because life was so hard trying to find a return. We, there were these terms like the hunt for yield, like it was some you know, mythical search for an unknown you know, beast or something out there in the wilderness. Uh, but now, because we started with cash at like 0%, now you're starting at a sensible return. And that means everything you're investing in, the expected returns have all gone up. Which is great if you're investing today. Sure, there's always going to be things bouncing around in markets. There's always going to be the next crisis on the news. And there's always going to be all the doom and gloom some person like me comes and talks about. Because no one comes along and says, oh, it's really good that markets went up, you know, 1% a month or year. Right? No one, no one plays that drastic, right? Everyone wants to know what, what's back. Now, the things that are newsworthy and things just plugging along they're doing well is a really newsworthy. So generally, don't come to seminars with the people like me. Um, but the, the really good news is that, that the, the, the starting rate of investing and the starting rate of return if you're investing in cash is, is better than it's been in a pretty long time. So that's good for savers like yourselves. All right. But if we, let's look out further, right? So we've talked about sort of that near-term horizon, talked about, you know, plenty of risks there. Um, Everyone can probably get the paper boats means. Um, but, but the big thing here, there's some, a couple of really big things that we're looking at in, as we look at in the long-term investment horizons. And that is, we're, we're probably entering a multipolar world. We've, we've effectively had this period in the last, you know, 20 to 30 years, particularly the last 20 years, where you end up with a, yeah, a sing single, singular, singular, Polarity in the world. Everyone's sort of behind, yeah, you know, with Western democratic systems and the other actors in the world kind of cooperated. We all worked together and it was all fantastic, particularly if you, you know, sold iron ore to a, a large industrialized emerging economy like, like we did. Um, but we're probably moving towards more of a Cold War blocks style mentality where people do, we're, we're using the term French oil. So rather than just finding the cheapest place to build something, you're using um, friendly countries, friendly jurisdictions for your supply chains, making supply chains more resilient um, and making sure you've got access to everything you need and then doubly making sure, right? Th these things are things we're looking at where you might get a little bit of a disconnect, right? These things are risks, but they also create opportunities. And then if we look at the other one, or we're calling decarbonisation, as in, and people can have different views, but ultimately it's there's a pretty high chance that there's lots of things that need to happen to, to make the world have less 
carbon in the atmosphere. Right? I've got, and people generally want it. And those people are probably from places you didn't realise. This is a, a survey of, you know, share of adults that say it's important to them that the country shifts away from fossil fuels. Um, we've got some interesting countries with low on percentages on the right here. These guys are probably a bit obvious. But US, UK, I, I can't remember the Australian stats off the top of my head, but it's, it's somewhere near, um, sort of 75, 81. But then Saudi Arabia, 85%, and see the importance, Brazil, China, South Africa, like, like the emerging economies and those with you know, significant um, carbon intensive development cycles, you know, people view fuel as important. So even if they view it as important, we can kind of tell where things are going and we're definitely not on track for it, which is the International uh, Energy Agency report on the right, which is obviously all, um, even more uh, impacted as, as people moved to turn on coal in Europe last year. But this is basically, I know it's a bit small here, but basically this says what you would need to do to get to net zero with uh, emissions. This is a sustainable development scenario, this sort of piece here, and up the top is sort of the policy scenarios or announced policies. We're so far away from it, it's not funny, aren't we? Like it's, it's, it, it, there's no realistic way in the short term to bridge that gap. Um, but so if people decided that we are going to move that way, there's lots of risks that happen to portfolios and opportunities. And that's sort of the theme here across. Now, I've, I've given you yeah, a few different pieces of information here, talked about things, looking for cracks, what's around the corner, why we, and lots of volatility, we had a war, came out of the pandemic, we, you know, interest rates have all gone up, bonds that used to be safe assets aren't safe because they attempted, had negative, big negative returns last year, We've got banks collapsing, and our financial year-to-date returns... Oops. Come on, Chris. There we go. Uh, sort of between 5 and 11%. As I said, don't come to the seven hours and listen to people like me. Um, really, with all the volatility that's happened, this is just financial year today. Obviously, if you go back to the start of last year, there were some pretty, pretty bad returns uh, as you know, markets... Yeah, you know, digested the start of the interest rate rises. But if you, this is just from one to one to now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy if I'm investing in that. Right? This is just representative of the, and some, some of the different risk levels. So go moderate, balanced growth, like sort of balanced growth, growth, and high growth. Um, yeah, like despite all of this things going on, Returns are pretty good, which yeah, and and you're investing today in a world where the cash is you know, basically force, I think, and for something to be worthwhile, you have to expect it to get even better return than that. It's a lot better than when Amazon was trading at X thousand times multiple of its earnings. So how could it ever make a return? Cash is returning zero, right? This, to us, is a much less hair-pulling out investment environment than we were in two years ago when it was by risk at any cost. And people just bid up whatever it was, you know. Remember Bitcoin? Um, it's, it's, so it is, it might, it might seem, it might seem like there's lots of uncertainty, but there's always uncertainty in investing. It might seem like there's been lots of volatility and yeah, in some sections of the market, there has been bounce, things bouncing around. But generally, things over long term, they still go up. And that's just in the last stoke and flashy obviously over the long term, things have a very long, strong trend up. But what, what would we do next, right? And, and do you a little bit of colour and happy to take any questions people want uh, up, um, after, after, after the Jonathan session at the end or just casually after is fine as well. Um, what's the security as philosophy, right? You can say, see by looking at some of those longer term pieces, Securitas really views itself as a long term investor for clients. It does think about being active, which basically means don't just take what the market gives you, think about what you want to own and what you don't. Uh, being dynamic, just sometimes you move it around a little bit. Um, be the first. Everyone hears the adage, don't have all your eggs in one basket, but sometimes it's a bit tricky to actually do it. Securitas does it. Um, thinking about being responsible, so trying 
not make money off really bad activities and, and, and really think about what the future holds. Think about what risk means to you, right? The, the team spent a lot of time on this uh, when they started working with us going, what does risk actually mean to our clients? And it wasn't really things bouncing around a little bit. It was, it was permanent loss of capital. So let's, let's make sure we don't have permanent loss of capital and let's make sure things recover. Really focus on that when they were talking to us about what was important. If they got that role, let us know. But, um, uh, you know, they were really keen to make sure understanding what risk meant to you, which was really about, you know, not permanently losing. And then obviously they think a lot about, and the team together with us think a lot about not paying fees incurring costs and tax that we don't have to. All right. So what to do going forward? And it's a good segue to the next space where John is going to talk. Well, we're thinking about the risk of inflation staying a bit higher. We just want to make sure we've got a little bit more resilience in portfolios. All right. So again, real assets such as infrastructure, which we'll talk about, they give you a little more color about what that looks like, and other inflation-linked investments. When we're talking about those cracks, make sure we've got some diversification and just look around the corner for those other issues that might have be repeat or, or rhyme to some of the things we've seen in markets and, and try and avoid exposures to it. Um, if we're having this big chance of recession, try and have a little more what we'd call quality in the portfolio, stronger balance sheets, less leverage, um, you know, stronger franchises of companies and so on. Just a little bit more of that to be a bit more resilient if, if that does happen in the next few years. Um, if we've got this multipolar world, diversify. Well, you don't know who's going to be the winner. So have allocation to emerging markets as well as to developed markets. Not a lot, just a little bit. And if we think the world is going to be decarbonized, have a sustainable tilt in the portfolio, both from a decarbonation perspective, but also avoiding unnecessary bad actors in portfolios. Uh, and so that's some of those are shorter term pieces. Some of them is long term. Hopefully you can sort of see, you yeah, know, bit a bit of common sense applying. And the good news is, I have to remind everyone, cash is four. It used to be zero and returns have been pretty good for the last little while and we expect over the long term it, it always comes good eventually so thank you all and i'll pass on to charlton